Hi guys. All right, so i um, gonna start with math. Today is the um, 19th of November. Today's Thursday. And so let me open up this math all the way. All right. <clears throat> So today in math, all right, so we, let me move me over here, how about, all right, so today in math, we started uh, multiplying, and um, we did a review first with what happens when we multiply um, by, oops, let me fix this, well, so let me fix this. <clears throat> multiply by 10, uh, 100, and 1,000. And so um, here, anytime we multiply anything by one, you get the same number. So three times one gives us the three. And then if we're multiplying by 10, 10 has one zero. So we add one zero at the end. Here, we're multiplying by 100. So notice it's still the three because we're doing three times one, but then we've got those two zeros on the end. And then here, um, three times 1,000, um, we have the three, and then we have our three zeros because 1,000 has three zeros. So we did a couple practice problems together. So on 13 here, um, we're using this box method and we're solving for 24 times five. So the first thing we did is we took the larger number 24 and we broke it down into um, its expanded form. So the two um, has a value of 20, the four has a value of four ones. So we put those in parentheses to keep those together. And then we multiplied all that by five. And so when we draw our box, whatever's in the parentheses is going to stay together on one of the sides. And then whatever you're multiplying it by, it needs to be adjacent meaning uh, right next to it side by side. So here's the 20 plus four with the five on the side. And then to get the partial product, which is um, what's inside this box here, you're gonna look up and over. So here, this is 20 times five. So two times five is 10 plus that one zero gives us 100. Here in this box here, if you look up, and you go all the way to the outside over, so up to the four, over to the five. Um, this is four times five, which gives us 20. These inside, these are called, if you look here, these are called partial products. And so partial products, you add them together to give you your total product. So 100 plus 20 is 120. So 24 times five is 120. On page 14, um, here we just we did the box as well, but here we did um, with the 50. I was showing how it doesn't matter what side as long as these things are adjacent. So here this was 52 times 6, which is the same as 50 plus 2 times 6. So the 50 plus 2 stayed together on one line and then next to it. So I could put the 6 on the top. I could put the 6 on the bottom as long as they're side by side. And then I'm ready to multiply. So here in this first box on top, we look up at the six and over to the 50. Six times five is 30. And then we add the one zero, so it makes 300. So 50 times six is 300. Then in this box here, we look up at the six and over. So six times two is 12. And then when we add those partial products, we get 312. So 52 times six gives us 312. Then um, page 15, we did in small group and then students for their independent work, they were working on their multiplication facts on page 16 and they had a video to watch on um, page uh, 17. And then we drafted that. Then, in reading today, come on. There it goes. 
All right. <clears throat> All right, and there it goes, finally. All right, in reading today, uh, we continue talking about cause and effect. Still not loaded all the way. There it goes. All right, so uh, let's see what page we're on, going down all the way to the jellyfish. All right, so this is called the rise of the jellyfish. So we read this first part here. And this first part was really more of, um, the text structure was really more of description. Um, we said it was doing a lot of uh, describing. Um, so it was talking about the jellyfish, talking about, you know, jellyfish don't have brains or blood or hearts and, and going over some of um, these things about um, different researchers. Um, the number of jellyfish that have grown over in, in just all these different areas, um, the sizes that they can get up to and all that. So we read about that. And then on this page here, um, we did an example together of a cause and effect. So it says jellyfish invasions also cause uh, beaches in Spain and Australia to close uh, for a while this summer. So the jellyfish invasions, um, invasions mean like there's just like these, like look at the picture, like there's just tons of these jellyfish together invading one area. And that led to those um, beaches being closed for the summer. They didn't want people to go and go swimming and things like that and be, on, um, be in the water with all these jellyfish around. So the effect of that was that they had to close the beaches. So um, we continued, uh, stu or students continued for their independent work, uh, continued reading through here, and then they also needed to make sure that they read um, this box right here, um, looking at those text features, because that had um, some as well. And then they had four causes and effects to fill out here. And then that was it, because we're going to do this one tomorrow. So that was it for that. So finding the cause and effect. Um, something happens, that's your cause, and then the effect, what happens after, okay? So then we drafted that. And then in small group today, we um, continued reading the story. Let me go down. Activities. Um, the story about George. So this is due tomorrow. It says right here, small group only week 14. So this is a paired passage. So there's two passages. Uh, one of them is the one on George. And then the other one is um, the one about the therapy training. And so some of the questions come just from that passage one. Some of them come from passage two. And then the ones at the end come from um, the both of them together. It's really comparing how are they the same? How are they different? And um, so students need to read and or we read the first story together. They were to read the second by themselves. And then today during small group, uh, we went back and we were talking about some of the questions and I was modeling how to go back to the text and find my answer and modeling how, you know, don't just pick one right away, like really look at you know, you can usually always get rid of two of them, but then look at what you've got left and really think about, you know, what, um, which one is stronger. And then in writing, This always takes so long to open. All right, so we've been working um, in tilted towers. We've been working um, with homophones, irregular verbs, irregular nouns, spelling patterns, and verb tense. So we did some more um, questions today. 
So we are down. All right, so um, we looked at these sentences and we left off on, all right, so we started on page 15. And so um, we, we talked about the answer why. Um, so this one, we said that it was uh, one where it needed to change to um, it without the apostrophe. Um, whenever you have that apostrophe, remember apostrophes have two jobs. The first job is um, they show that ownership. So um, like on, let me erase this so you can see what I is under here. So right here on B, it says change students to students with the apostrophe S. And we looked at this word students and we looked um, over here to the right, the word that follows is the word at, and that wasn't showing any ownership and having students with the apostrophe S, it's not a contraction, it doesn't stand for anything. And so we said that that wasn't correct, that it was just students because we're talking about um, the plural of student. So on this one, however, this apostrophe, it's using it as a contraction standing for it is. So whenever you see that, a little red flag should go off and you should say, okay, I need to check this to see if that's the actual, you know, it's that we need. And so it says the students at the aquarium thought the walrus was looking at them, but it was actually looking at, and then if I plug this in, looking at it is own reflection, that sounds silly. That doesn't make any sense. So we don't need the apostrophe it is because that's what that stands for. And when we split it apart, um, that doesn't make any sense. So we just need looking at it. So we went with this one here, it's the second choice um, is the one we needed. So we, we picked that. Um, this quizzes, we are doing this tomorrow. Um, this here, the quick write students did, so they picked one of these and they typed that there. And then we looked at some more questions together. So we looked at number seven. It says, what change if any should be made in this sentence? So here, this was a spelling one. It was just the word difficult uh, was spelled incorrectly. It has two Fs, so we changed that. And then this one also, um, when they put halves, um, you change the F to a VES when you make, uh, when you change that to halves. So um, then these here, um, students did these on their own and then we're doing this tomorrow. So tomorrow we're gonna do page um, 19 and 15, but the rest of everything in this document should all be um, complete. We kind of jumped around a little bit at the bottom here, but everything else should all be completed. So we drafted that. Then in science, All right. <laughs> All right, so today, all right, so today we read this on natural resources and we highlighted some important information. So it says natural resources are the basis of life on earth. Humans have always depended on things that exist freely in nature to survive. People do not make natural resources, but gather them from the earth. Examples include sunlight, air, water, wood, oil, wind power, hydroelectric energy, and coal. There are two types of natural resources, renewable resources and non-renewable resources. When something is renewable, it means that it can be replaced or brought back. They will never, be, uh, they will never run out. 
For example, soil, sunlight, water, and wood are renewable resources. After cutting a tree, it will eventually grow back, which means the trees are renewable resources. Non-renewable resources are the opposites of renewable resources, which means that they will run out. It takes a long time to be replaced. Examples of non-renewable resources include the fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. Did you not think that the gasoline we use in our cars to drive will eventually run out? Someday there won't be any gasoline left and we will have to use something else to be able to drive our cars. People cannot live without natural resources because they use them on a daily basis. For example, you need resources to eat and drink. The silverware you use to, the, to eat with are made from raw materials which come from our natural resources. Think about all the buildings in your neighborhood that need, that need energy for heating and cooling. Natural resources are everywhere and how we use them today will define our future. So we read that and then students um, answered these questions from the text and then um, they watched the video on um, 13 and then we drafted that. And then um, we had library today, so there's an activity probably, um, I, I don't have access to it, but I'm sure there's an activity for the kids to do on um, library. So we didn't have social studies today because of that. And then um, we went to, we had a little bit of time, we went to Scratch. And we did some coding today during our intervention time. So we went, let me move me over here. We went to um, create, or we created an account. And then uh, we went to create. And so um, from here, there's all the different blocks over here on the side. Um, there's different options you can choose down here. So the kids were um, exploring and I asked them to try to do some kind of um, representation of uh, what they've learned with uh, renewable and non-renewable resources. So um, they were looking at the different blocks and different things they could do. And then um, if they wanted to share, I asked um, for them to share on um, Seesaw. And that was it. So that was our day today. Let me know if you have any questions. And remember tomorrow is Friday, so everything needs to be completed and turned in tomorrow. And I hope you guys have a good day. All right. Bye, guys.